We're going to starting our investment course, and this is our first uh, lecture. What I will do is, and let's get to zoom into this little textbook here, the by Bodhi and Kane. Uh, this textbook is uh, what well, this is essentials introduction. And all I will try to do today is cover as much as possible, hopefully for the first 70 minutes, hopefully uh, cover chapter 1. Today I will be done with it. And for the next time I plan that we begin with a technical analysis, roughly 3 or 4 weeks in technical analysis. So, section 1. First section is real versus Financial. Yes. So that's the first topic. And you got to understand in investments, it is of paramount importance to understand that there are real assets and that there are financial assets and that there is a world of difference between a real asset and a financial asset. So we got to define what is the one and what is the other. So real asset simply means an asset, something of value which has value because of its intrinsic value and it is not someone else's liability. And immediately we provide the definition of a financial asset. And a financial asset is an asset which is someone else's liability. This is the strict definition. So, now we get to the point of providing a large number of examples. A watch is a real asset. This marker is a real asset. The video camera that we record this lecture on is a real asset. Real estate again is a real asset. So all of those assets, stones, anything else essentially you gotta think about it has physical matter, has, it has physical representation. Table is a real asset. So what might be typical examples of financial assets? Well financial asset, the one classical example is a bond. Uh, I will be getting to explaining it in the next section. Another classical example is a stock. Of course, bonds have dozens of different variations, preferred, non-preferred, cumulative, and all this kind of stuff. That's not quite the subject of what I'm trying to do today. Of course, you have preferred stocks and all the other stuff. That's also not a, a, a lot of variations. You also have derivatives. Derivatives also a major uh, group of financial assets and we also have as a major asset currencies. So currencies is in the sense of a paper currency. So you have a bill, uh, I don't have a dollar bill but I have a uh, 20 level bill. 20 level bill is a financial asset it is the liability of the central bank. So the central bank issues it and it's a liability. It is backed by some other asset of the central bank. Uh, in Bulgaria, because we are on a currency board, the asset is euro. So our, my 20 level are backed by the central banks. 10 euro ratio is approximately 2 for 1. So for all of these, there is a promise to pay, and usually the way to understand is that the financial asset usually has some real asset. Now, for real asset, oftentimes is used the word physical or physical asset. Now, for financial asset, Financial asset is often called paper. Simply is called paper. So sometimes it's just called paper. Uh, more often you'll hear paper assets. 
Now, the opposite of paper and of real acids for physical, the alternative to physical is called hard. So, it's also called a hard acid. So, in times of inflation, I'm just giving an example. You're better off investing in hard assets, not paper. Paper usually loses value during inflation. So, usually paper assets are backed by the ultimately underlying have their value or derive their value out of the currency. And in times of inflation, when the currency loses value, all out of paper typically also uses value. Not all, not all is, but physical and real assets are usually, typically, unaffected by inflation. In other words, you got yourself a house or you got yourself a piece of land. Doesn't matter how much and how hard the government inflates or does whatever it does, inflation is not affecting your hard asset. Your house gives you the same value, whatever is the value of the currency or bonds or stocks or anything else. All right, so that's the one classification. What you should understand, and that's very important, is that Wall Street hates real assets. Wall Street doesn't like, it doesn't want real assets, and doesn't want investors to uh, invest in real assets. There is a phenomenally simple reason. Wall Street is in the business of manufacturing financial assets. Wall Street does not create any real assets, does not use any real assets. Wall Street is in the business of getting something, creating a financial asset, for example, creating a stock or creating a bond on the primary markets or could be for central bank's currencies and then trading it on the secondary markets. So Wall Street is in the business mostly of financial assets. So Wall Street has an inherent bias towards financial assets. Also, when real asset prices rise and keep rising and are expected to keep rising, this means inflation. And if it means inflation, inflation inherently implies that financial assets lose value. How? What is the mechanism? Well, remarkably simple. Rising inflationary expectations mean rising interest rates. Rising interest rates mean rising discount factor. And if you have a stock, bond, or whatever cash stream, if you discount with a higher discount factor, its price necessarily goes down. Rising real assets, rising commodities, commodities are a prominent example of real assets, hurt Wall Street's main line of business. So Wall Street has a built-in inherent bias and you have to understand this always. So that's why Wall Street always speaks bad or ill of the prospects of uh, commodities because commodities spell inflation. Interestingly enough, real estate and real estate houses in terms of Wall Street's interpreta interpretation is not an inflation. If real estate prices go up, Wall Street tells you it is a wealth effect. In relative course, it is also inflation, but Wall Street doesn't want you to know it and understand it as inflation. Again, for the same reason, it hurts their business. All right, so that's good enough for section one. Let's see any questions before I move to number two. Anyone? No. All right, let's move on. I think the textbook calls it taxonomy. Taxonomy is uh, a fancy word for classification. For this course, we will need and we will use uh, a well-established uh, classification. And that classification, we call them investment, investment classes. Oops, investment assets. 
which is the same as equal to investment classes. This is uh, again okay, that's section number two. So this is something that's fairly simple. It's fairly straightforward. Nothing really special. You have five major asset classes. Let's just outline them. Number one, you have stocks. And stocks are an example of a financial asset. Then you have bonds. And bonds are also an example of a financial asset. Number three, you have real estate. Real estate is an example of a real asset. Number four, you have commodities, respectively commodities. Uh, all right, commodities will be agricultural commodities. You may have, let's say, uh, metals, uh, copper, zinc. Within metals, you have precious metals. You have base metals. Uh, so you have a whole bunch of commodities in there. And the final category is that of currencies. So currencies will include dollar, yen, euro, etc. All right. One of them is remarkably peculiar, is of a mixed time, is a hybrid, and it is special. And that one is gold. But sometimes gold behaves purely as a commodity. And with gold, so is silver. So, at some times, gold behaves almost entirely as a commodity, and at other times, gold behaves more like a currency. Depending on the circumstances, when the environment is inflationary, gold shifts from a classical commodity into a classical currency. When you have a disinflationary environment, the exact opposite occurs. It moves away from a currency and becoming back into a commodity. So gold has this peculiar dual or hybrid nature. So that's the classification. For all exam and all analysis purposes, you have to, you have to analyze and break down according to all of these asset classes. So, now the question becomes then, uh, what is the textbook usually covering? This particular textbook covers practically stocks and practically bonds, and that's the end of it. So, stocks covered, and here is another important thing to realize. This coverage is for the benefit of Wall Street. In other words, you cover something that is in the inherent interest of Wall Street. What about bonds? Of course, cover the main subject again in the interest of Wall Street. Wall Street does not manufacture currencies, and somehow this textbook skips the topic as if that as a class doesn't exist. Same thing with commodities. Yes, I have found, I've, of course, to prepare for this course, I had to read, suffer through this textbook. And yes, uh, indeed, there were maybe three paragraphs in this whole textbook about commodities. Well, commodities, for all practical purposes, are a lot more important as a class than stocks or bonds. They underline your lives. Wheat, you get to eat bread every day. All right? So, <coughs> Crude oil, you get to, or at least I get to drive practically every day. So, commodities drive our lives. And yet, this textbook omits it. 
You gotta understand that there is something sinister in this part. You gotta understand that it is a mixture of a little bit of incompetence on the finance guys and a lot of endorsement on the Wall Street. You gotta understand that Wall Street's got its hands in this textbook and what was written, it was written with endorsement of Wall Street. You gotta understand what really happens is if there are six alternative textbooks and some of them emphasize commodities and real estate, Wall Street and especially currencies doesn't like this. So Wall Street will not endorse the textbook. And if the Wall Street doesn't endorse the textbook, ultimately it won't be getting into the classrooms. So you gotta understand that Wall Street really wants you to study from this textbook so that you become relatively unaware and incompetent in the properties of commodities, currencies, and real estate. And that is very important for you to understand. Because what happens here, if you get to understand them well, might not be in the best interest of Wall Street. All right? You got to understand that all this whole thing sets that Wall Street machine, all right, or institutions. All right, so that's on taxonomy. Another type of taxonomy is related to money markets. Money markets and capital uh, markets. I uh, mentioned last time, I mentioned last time, uh, usually these are studied in what is called financial markets and institutions. There's also a course or textbooks usually called money and capital markets. Uh, that's where they are studied. They're mentioned to some extent in a course in money and banking for all of the purposes here. A money market is a market in money market instruments. So this relates to, uh, let me see, short, short term instruments and capital markets relate to long term instruments. Short term instruments are by convention, by definition less than one year maturity and long term have more than one year or maturity longer than a year or a year or more. So that's another important classification in terms of financial markets. Let's see what else we have. Sometimes the market for bonds is called fixed income market. So that's typical. And the market for stocks is called the equity market. So essentially what I'm doing guys today is something simple. I'm introducing terminology that we will be using for the rest of the semester. So when we say equity market, this means a market where stocks are traded. Similarly, when we say fixed income market, it's just a market for bonds. Of course, there's a wide variety of bonds, uh, like government bonds and municipal bonds and corporate bonds, etc., etc. So I'm not going to get into that. Let's see what else we have in the uh, taxonomy. All right, another underlying, at least for the fixed income uh, market and concept in investments is the concept of a default. Default has very many different strict definitions, especially in law, but in economics we're simply saying a non-payment or a non-satisfaction of a, an obligation when your obligation is due. So you owe money, you owe a certain amount of payment, you gotta make a certain payment, and if you can't make a payment you are in default, that, that's how we call it. We're in default. So, then from default derives the concept of a default risk. And this is simply the risk that the borrower will not 
make all of its payments on time or some of its payment on time. In other words, the risk of defaulting. Of course, it applies for bonds and mostly fixed income securities. For stocks, it is not so applicable as a stock technically cannot default. There's only one rare case that we can consider a stock in default is when the company, the stock, has declared a dividend on the stock. Once the dividend is declared by the board of directors, the, div the dividend becomes a legal obligation. And it is due when it's due on the dividend date. And if the corporation cannot pay the dividend, it is technically in default. Of course, the default will hurt the stockholders, so they'll never get themselves into this trouble, but legally or technically that could possibly happen. Okay, so default is usually associated with loans, with credits, and also with debt. So the bond market has two different names also besides fixed income. Sometimes it's called the credit market and sometimes it's called the debt market. So debt usually stands as the opposite of equity. So sometimes you say the debt market and the equity market. Alright? Any questions? All right, let's see what else we got here. Common stock equity. All right, another very important uh, uh, financial instrument. Sometimes now they even think of it as a separate asset class. I mean, it's getting a little tricky. Do we call it a sixth asset class? Uh, again, very controversial. I don't want to get into that. We just say what is a derivative. A derivative is a financial instrument whose value is based or derived from another instrument. The other instrument is called the base instrument. So you may have an option and the option is on stock. So I'm just giving one example. You know, there is a myriad of derivative instruments. So I have a stock option, which is an option on a stock. So the stock itself becomes the base instrument, and the stock option is the derivative. The stock option derives its value entirely based on the value of the stock. Of course, it also depends on the time until the auction expires, on the strike price, and so forth. Uh, this textbook has uh, about a part, I think like three chapters on derivatives, but what I do is rather skip the derivative analysis altogether in order to provide or open up room to cover some real estate, to cover some commodity, and uh, cover some currencies, some not a lot of currencies, and in order to open up some space and room for other analyses besides fundamental analysis and portfolio analysis, mainly to add some technical and cyclical uh, analysis. All right, let's see what else we have. All right, so the next uh, topic is uh, number three, one three, that's page six, financial markets and the economy. So, the basic question, the basic question is, what purposes do financial markets serve? And there are plenty, I'm not going to follow exactly what it says, but mostly. Uh, allocation of resources. This is the concept which I covered the previous hour of financial intermediation. Financial intermediation means those that have excess or surplus resources lend them to those that need them. In financial markets, through the function of financial intermediation, 
all allocate those resources. So it is channeling of funds and effectively allocating free resources in the economy. The second major function is that of, uh, well, let's just do this, allocation of risk, especially in uh, recent years, uh, allocation of risk or shifting or transferring of risk or hedging of risk, all of this stuff has become an integral part in investment or financial markets. Another one, which is the first part, is uh, timing, timing of consumption. What it simply means is if I have some excess funds this month and I have some excess funds next month and uh, for a fairly long period of time, rather than just saving purely in cash and money, I will simply use the financial markets and invest in some sort of instrument. Of course, it could be a physical asset like gold and silver. It could be a financial asset like a government bond. It could be in stock. It could be in anything. So I'll try to find an appropriate investment class, an appropriate instrument within that class. I just could buy me a house. I mean, it depends. So I'll find uh, a, an appropriate uh, class and then an instrument within the class that will satisfy my needs. My needs may be that I decide, let's say, to buy a house 12 months from now, so I'm going to save it with an instrument that will allow me to do that. Now, because of its consumption, it may be that I might be planning to go on vacation somewhere in Europe that I'll need, let's say, 4,000 euro. So I'll get me an instrument where I'm going to invest that will be due in June when I'm going to have my vacation and consume. All right? Let's see what else we have. Allocation. All right, the next one is separation of ownership and management. So, financial markets allow us to separate ownership from management. Owners are those that actually own it, that get to reap the ultimate benefit. And management is simply someone who runs it. So, when you have stock markets with the entity called corporation, you can effectively separate out the owners, which we call, uh, let's see, stock owners or stock holders. So, the buyers, owners of stock, we call stockholders or stock owners, they are the owners of the corporation and we can separate out a separate body, a number of people that we call management and management runs it on behalf of the owners. When you get this, you always get a number of problems, information problems, which we call how? How we call it in economics? Agency. Agency problems. Uh, this one is even known as the principal agent problem. The principal agent problem arises. So, well, let's say who's the principal here? Uh, the principal here is the owner, and the agent is the management. So, management acts as the agent of the owner. So, the principal agent problem arises because of asymmetric information. Owners don't know enough about management, the managers can abuse them when they get their jets and all the good stuff, you know, luxury cars and everything else. They get these corporate villas on the ocean or on the beach and they get to go on a vacation there, right? They just say, we're going to go there to, now to the corporate villa for one week uh, and we're going to be discussing corporate business when we're glad to just go and have fun, right? All right, so uh, this is an example of the principal agent problem. All right, let's see what else we have here. 
Uh, well, that's good enough. Uh, problems of the principal agent type is a subject in management. Business uh, uh, students should be uh, familiar called corporate governance. Gover So, corporate governance essentially is the subject which studies how to create proper incentives for management, how to design and create those incentives, and a set of monitoring and a set of control so as to alleviate or so as to mitigate the principal agent problem. All right, so that's related to corporate governance. In other words, corporate governance, there is some sort of trust. You gotta trust managers, you gotta trust CEOs. Well, what the 2001 and 2002 showed was that there was a major crisis. Crisis of confidence. What we learned and realized what that was that corporate CEOs are greedy and corrupt. And one will be one example, and these guys are getting filthy rich and making not tens, more like hundreds of millions of dollars a year while looting the company, literally. So, if you're an investor, you'd better not invest in that kind of company. Or better yet, you should know how to detect such a company. You should be able to sniff out that management is kind of like corrupt. Or you should be able to detect corporate governance issues and not invest. Or even better, maybe expect the stock will fall and actually short the stock. All right? So this has been, well, you got to understand this is, uh, okay, so something else. Uh, the textbook leaves you with the impression, well, it certainly wants to teach you incorrectly that this crisis of corporate governance just happened in 2001, 2002, and is it, it has never happened before. The reality is completely different. It has been going on and on and on in history and in every bull market that you get there are problems that with Wall Street surface after the boom and all these problems with corporate governance. So corporate governance meaning corporate corruption in Wall Street corruption is a regular and recurrent problem since the very beginning of Wall Street Wall Street has been beset by corruption and trust problems. So the idea is in cycles. People get to believe in Wall Street. They trust Wall Street. Of course, Wall Street screws them, as Peter Schiff says. And then they lose confidence in Wall Street. And Wall Street gets into the next cycle of regaining confidence all over again. That confidence is associated with corporate governance, but it is also associated with the currencies. Once the currency gets to depreciate rapidly and lose value against everything else, meaning, meaning against other currencies and most importantly against commodities, you get to lose trust in Wall Street. So Wall Street then is in the business of rebuilding confidence. All right, let's see what else we have. Okay, we have accounting scandals. I'm not going to discuss that. Are uh, accounting scandals? There has been a brand new subject that you should typically study uh, called forensic accounting. Forensic accounting is a very new discipline for which when you see accounting reports, you try not to analyze and make a financial analysis. You try to detect how the corporate CEO, CFO, and the accountant actually attempted to cheat in the accounting to circumvent 
gap rules or accounting regulations and effectively mislead you. This is perfectly normal. 99.9% .9 of U.S. corporations kind of twist their accounting. You gotta understand that. It's been extremely, this is common. When a CFO and accountant is hired, he's hired not on the basis of providing good accounting. He's hired on the basis of his skills to manipulate accounting reports. All right? So, this is what is important. So, you get a whole bunch of accounting uh, scandals. You now get to learn, and you should if you're going to be in the investment arena, uh, forensic accounting. How to see that they cheat you. There are a lot of different ways and tricks that they employ and you got to know how to detect them. All right? Let's see what else. Okay, so another major problem on Wall Street was associated with IPO. This is an initial public offering. This is the first time that a private corporation sells its stock and effectively becomes from a par private corporation a publicly traded one. So we find out that during the late 90s with the dot-com boom, uh, Wall Street lied and cheated on IPOs, rewarded its own best friends and best customers at the expense of common investors. In common investors got screwed, all right? So that's a one, you know, beloved mechanism to screw investors. And it is very often used. There seems to be that, at least last year and possibly this year, Bulgarian stock market is getting to the point where uh, there is such an overheated IPO market with oversubscriptions of over a thousand times that now our market is perfect and ripe for IPO corruption. Probably there is, I don't know of any specific example, but knowing history, I know that there has got to be, because in this type of, of environment, there always has been historically, all right? Let's see what else. All right, so next section is one, four, so this is section number four, which is the investment process. All right, so what is the investment process? Well, the first basic uh, form, the the first basic concept in this section is that of a portfolio. So portfolio, for all of its fancy meaning, is simply a collection of assets, simply a set of assets. They may be financial, they may be real assets, it's just a collection of assets we call a portfolio. That's it. Now, asset classes, they're already discussed. The next is called asset allocation. So, Asset allocation is how you split your portfolio between the five asset classes. Well, in this textbook, they'll get you to believe that there are effectively only two asset classes, like stocks and bonds, and that's the end of it. Well, there is, of course, real estate, gold, and everything else. So, the asset allocation is, believe me, the most important uh, decision that any investor must make how much to put in real estate and how much in stock and how much in gold. And the asset allocation is uh, primarily determined by the macroeconomic environment. Is the environment of stable inflation? Is the environment inflationary? Is the environment deflationary? Is the environment of a booming economy? Is the environment of a weakening or 
stagflationary economy. So the macroeconomic environment is of paramount importance. Nothing is more important. That is why last year I did for some of you guys macroeconomic investment course. In macroeconomic investment course, well, in general, you must determine what's the macroeconomic environment. Out of it follows what is the appropriate asset allocation. Once you solve the asset allocation uh, problem, then which particular assets will become a relatively easier problem of itself, all right? So, let's see what else we have. What we have is two fundamental approaches to uh, portfolio construction. So, portfolio construction or asset allocation has a uh, top down and, and bottom up approach. A top down approach is uh, let's say you decide that 20% of your assets, okay, let me try it differently. Let me draw this pie here. So, 20% of your assets will be in US. So, this is US. Then, you'll have, let's say, 30% will be in Europe, and maybe 50% will be in Asia. So, that will be a top-down approach. Then, within U.S., you want to do, let's say, a little bit or a big chunk of it to be in pharmaceuticals. If it's Europe, you want to be, let's say, in cars. All right? Part of it, you say, well, I want maybe 30% of my portfolio to be in commodities. So, you take your commodities, make it 30%. Some of your commodity investment will be in Bulgaria. Some other commodity investment will be in Singapore. A third part of your commodity investment will be in London. In other words, you may be buying gold. But you will be diversifying your gold holding of where you hold it and where you store it. You will have some at your house, probably buried somewhere in the ground. You will have some in a London vault. You'll have some in a Swiss vault. And maybe you'll have some, I don't know, in a Japanese fund. I don't know. Anyway, the point is that you got to think in a top-down approach, which are the geographies, what is the asset allocation, and once you get, as I said, to decide on pharmaceuticals, then in a top-down approach, you will say Pfizer so much, Merck so much, etc. So you go top-down until you get to the number of companies. Top-down approach will be you have to have, let's say, I'm just giving an example, 30% commodities. And out of these 30% commodities, you will have 10% in precious metals, 10% in energy, and 10% in agriculturals. Those 10% in precious metals, you'll put in the bulk in silver and some in gold. Those in energy, half will be in, let's say, crude oil, a quarter will be in natural gas, and a quarter will be in uranium. Once you get to uranium, now you say, okay, the top two uranium companies are uh, whatever, and you say, this uranium company, I'm going to get 70%, and this uranium company, 30%. Is it fair to clear? All right, bottom-up approach might be, all right, well, let me see, and just looking into a company, okay, this is a good company, good management, good business, and everything else, and you get to invest. The problem with the bottom-up approach is that you may get overly exposed into one geographic area or into one country or into one asset class. You get to invest in stocks only at the end of the day. So you may get a not appropriate uh, asset allocation across asset classes and the bottom-up approach. You might not get a good allocation globally or even within the country or you might get too much local exposure. All right, let's see what else we have. 
That's it. That's it. We move on to one, five. One, five, R is a favorite topic of uh, financial professors that markets are competitive. So, number five. Competitive financial markets. So, if markets are competitive, and this is the most basic of all lessons in economics, is that you cannot get something for nothing. This is called in economics the trade-off. So, in investments, there's always a trade-off. If you want to get some more of a return, or at least an expected return, you must always sacrifice something else in return. That sacrifice is called risk. So, markets are competitive, and there is that fundamental uh, relationship that higher expected return must necessarily be accompanied by a higher risk. In other words, you gotta, if you want to get the higher return, you gotta, be, you gotta pay a higher price. That price is bearing a higher risk. So, that's one of the fundamental lessons within competitive markets. So, that's the first major one. The second major one is that markets are efficient. Well, this is a concoction of economics and investment professors that uh, in investment or financial markets are efficient. Uh, we will be talking about efficiency a lot more. I don't really want to get into efficiency now. There are different efficiency types, a strong efficiency, weak efficiency, semi-strong, etc. I don't want to get into that uh, now at all. I'll just skip that uh, portion altogether. All right. Another section here within competitive markets is about, uh, let's see, active. And passive, this will be investment strategy, investment strategy, sometimes known as investment style. Let me explain these. So, a passive strategy or style is used simply by a fairly large and fairly diversified index and you hold it. In your strategy, you pretty much say, I'm going to hold 50% risky assets and 50% risk-free assets. So, in that type of a strategy, you simply say risky versus risk-less or risk-free. Risk in other words, you decide how much risk to bear or how to allocate risk. Sometimes this is called the risk allocation problem. So you first decide how much is going to be risk free, how much is going to be risky. Once you've decided on a certain percentage, 50, all you do is buy an appropriately diversified index. It may be simply Dow Jones index. It may be the Nikkei, or it may be a mixture of European indices, or maybe just a worldwide index of a number of different indices. So, when you follow a passive strategy, it simply means that you decide and then you effectively follow, just keep it. With an active strategy, you are trying to actively select the investment vehicles or instruments, it could be also real assets, gold, and you choose them so that you believe that they will effectively outperform the market. So, here is the connection. The connection is that if a market is efficient, it is 
very hard, economists claim, impossible to beat the market. In an efficient market, it is impossible to beat the market. So, if the markets are efficient, the only solution is a passive, only meaningful solution is a passive strategy. However, active strategy is in a strict conflict with efficient markets, and it simply means that if you really want an, a, an active strategy, it implies that the markets aren't efficient. All right, I'm not going to discuss are they, are they not, all this kind of stuff. All right, let's see. One, six. One, six. How much time have we got, guys? Hmm? Ten minutes, twenty minutes, all right. So, the next is one, six, which is the players. This is a little bit uh, startling for me. I can't really understand that, but okay. Uh, number one is firms. Yes, they are fairly large and big players. Firms are effectively businesses, and these businesses finance themselves by issuing securities. Uh, let's see. Let's try because I... Security in finance, in investments, is the same as financial instrument. And this is the same as financial asset. So, when I say financial asset, I mean, and when I say security, I mean the same thing, which is financial instrument, which is an asset, which is someone else's liability. So, the point that I'm making here about firms, that firms finance themselves by issuing securities. They issue debt securities, which is bonds, and they issue equity securities. So, firms participate on the financial markets mostly or predominantly to finance themselves because they have borrowing needs. Then you have households, I usually shorten it with HH, households usually lend to financial markets, at least some of the households, those that have surplus funds, and other households borrow. They may borrow through credit cards, through another financial intermediary. They may borrow through a mortgage company for their mortgage loan. They may borrow through, let's say, uh, for, for a car loan. So households also participate usually in both. Another big player is the government. Governments never have surplus funds. They are always short on funds. So governments always borrow. They borrow by issuing securities, which we call government bonds. Well, so they issue government treasuries, government notes, and government bonds. So governments always play by selling securities and raising funds on the financial markets. And then the last one, and they've kind of put it last, is financial intermediaries. And financial intermediaries, for what it's worth, have become, become the most important institution, meaning they have the largest shares. Within these financial intermediaries, the most important are always commercial banks. But now in investment markets, pension funds have become very important. Over the last five or six years, for other institutional reasons, hedge funds have become, have become very important. So these financial institutions now rule and dominate the financial markets, and all the others have become fairly small and fairly insignificant. So the textbook must have developed in great detail this part and must have mentioned this, but I want to leave you with the impression that 
people, businesses, and individuals are kind of like the big players. No, they're the small players that don't matter. All right, let's see what else we have. Uh, all right, another very important group within financial institutions is that of investment bankers. So, investment bankers are in the business of investment banking. Investment banking essentially is the business of connecting customers with the primary markets. So, primary and secondary market. A primary market is a market where a security is issued or sold, we also call it underwritten, for the first time. So, the security did not exist, and in the, on the primary market it comes to existence and it gets sold to its first buyer and investor. So, non-existent security begin their life and their trading. Secondary markets are markets that uh, trade already existing securities. Secondary markets are by far much, much, much larger than primary markets. One example of a primary market will be the market for IPOs, which I mentioned a little bit ago. All right, so investment bankers are in the business of connecting those that need to raise funds with the primary market. So, your General Motors, you need three billion dollars and you gotta decide whether you wanna issue stocks or bonds. Investment banker will advise you. He will tell you, he, he will consider your best interest when in reality he will consider how he can do the job easier and charge you a higher fee for that because he doesn't care for GE or GM's interest. He cares about his fee and his bonus. His bonus at the end of the semester or quarter or year depends entirely on the fees that he was able to generate. So his objective, that of the investment banker, is to maximize the fees that they can get short term. I mean, they long term, they never think long term. So, they will advise uh, GM or GE whether to issue stock or issue bonds. Issuing, that keyword issuing, is associated always with primary markets. And when the company issues, the investment banker is said to underwrite. Underwriting means to accept or assume the responsibility of issuing and distributing the security, whether stock or bond, or even possibly a straight loan, commercial loan. I mean, most could be for three billion dollars. Loan could be for, let's say, uh, nuclear, let's say for nuclear electric generation. Well, Nuclear generation takes five billion dollars or five billion euros. So the investment banker will arrange, underwrite the five billion dollar loan, and then he will resell it to investors, however he deems best and easiest, for his one or two or whatever percent fee. All right. So investment bankers play a critical role for the functioning of the primary markets. The critical role for the functioning second mar secondary markets is for brokers. Brokers play the critical role for the appropriate functioning of secondary uh, markets. Alright, let's see what else I have. And we finish, at least I intend to finish today, with some uh, trends which the textbook under uh, Outlines. I don't want to get into uh, any more than what the textbook uh, says. So these are some 
trends. So the first major trend is that of globalization. Financial markets, capital markets, money markets, all markets in the world have truly become global and international in nature. Most markets or most securities trade on more than one market at the same time. You may have government, US government bonds trading at the same time in New York, Tokyo, and Hong Kong, right? Or Singapore. So that's perfectly possible. You may have gold trading in New York Stock Exchange, now in Dubai, also in the Tokyo, etc. So in many ways, you may also have specific stock. Let's say a Microsoft stock would not necessarily trade only on the New York Stock Exchange, it will also trade on other exchanges. All right, so globalization is one major trend which has been established. Let's see what else we have in terms of trends. We have number two, securitization. Securitization is the pooling of similar assets, maybe let's say student loans, 1,000 students borrowed to study in the university. So an investment banker will pull these loans together and jointly will sell them as one security. The idea is that each individual student has a fair risk, but hard to determine. But when you take thousand students, there will be sufficient diversification so that for the whole security of thousand students, risk will more or less wash out and should be fairly easily determinable. For example, that you would expect that out of thousand students, roughly 20 will default on their loans for the next 20 years. All right, so for that's what securitization is, and in the other course, I will provide a full lecture on it. I don't want to get into that, but the basic idea is that you get a bunch of similar uh, loans or debts, could be car loans. Again, you take 1,000 car loans, you put them together, and possibly slice them into different pieces and sell them to uh, insurance companies, investment funds, etc. Similar with mortgages and subprime mortgages it has been happening in recent years. So securitization is the next big one. The third big one is called financial engineering. So financial engineering means the construction of new type of securities with new properties and new different features to satisfy one or possibly both of these two characteristics. The first one is investor demand. In other words, investors fall into different niches. Some investors want very low risk, like university endowments. Other investments, like hedge funds, want a lot of risk. And still others may want only a moderate risk. So, financial engineering will design a specific risk return profile, possibly under different circumstances, to perfectly match the investor niche or the investment demand. And that's one of the jobs of financial engineering. A lot of the financial engineering is designed to satisfy this one. The other one is related to financial or banking regulations. Meaning when the government imposes one sort or another restrictive regulation, usually the result is financial engineering with new instruments that will be, that will be used to evade or avoid the regulation. So usually the way it works is uh, financial engineering spawns a new industry 
the new industry is used in a credit expansion. The industry blows up as every credit expansion must. And then come regulators, they put in a whole bunch of restrictive regulations, which means or uh, drives another way of financial engineering to evade these regulations and find alternative ways around these restrictive regulations. So that's financial engineering. Number four is computer networks. All right, since uh, the event of the mainframe and later on the personal computer, uh, markets have become connected and interconnected. And now you guys are all connected to the internet, so all exchanges effectively are, all investment institutions are, and all small investors also are, as you, me, or anyone else, can simply log in on the web to their broker and through the broker to the exchange. All right, so this is another new characteristic of financial markets which is here to stay. Let's see if I have anything else. No, I don't. 1-8, I'm done for today. Well guys, thank you and have a good weekend.